Hello and welcome to Atopic Dermatitis 360, Real World Strategies to Improve Outcomes. My name is Eric Simpson. I'm Professor and Director of Clinical Trials at the Department of Dermatology at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Learning Objectives. Discuss AD treatment approaches specific to adults for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Optimally integrate into clinical practice the biologics and small molecule inhibitory agents recently approved for the treatment of AD based on efficacy and safety data. Effectively manage treatment side effects. And outline safety and efficacy data for the emerging treatments for atopic dermatitis. This program is approved for one half credit of CME, CNE, CPE, and AAPA credit. You can download a PDF of the presentation under the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen under the headshot. You'll be redirected back to the landing page after the webinar to complete the post test and evaluation. You can then download or print your certificate. The program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education, LLC, an HMP company. This program is supported by an educational grant from Pfizer. So atopic dermatitis is considered a disease of childhood. But recent data show that atopic dermatitis can often start in adulthood. So this is a meta-analysis of 17 studies where 26.1% of adults with AD were adult onset. They found that adults with AD onset, or they found that AD onset in adults had more atopy, more foot dermatitis, and were less flexural. Common sites of involvement in the adult were head, neck, and hands. A recent cohort study, or actually two cohort studies uh, from the UK, this is uh, a very recent data from 2019, confirmed that there is such a thing as adult onset atopic dermatitis. And they actually found that 40% of patients had adult onset disease. So this poses a challenge for clinicians because we are usually used to seeing atopic dermatitis start as a child. And when an older patient presents with a new onset eczematous eruption, we often think about allergic contact dermatitis or other conditions such as lumbar dermatitis, but we're not thinking about atopic dermatitis. So I think the, these recent studies, meta-analysis and cohort studies, should prompt us to be more comfortable in making the diagnosis of atopic dermatitis uh, in adults. Now, these are overwhelming criteria and were uh, primarily designed for a pediatric condition, for the pediatric uh, patient. Uh, and these are the Hannafin Rika criteria, as well as the distillation of these criteria called the UK Working Party criteria, which are primarily used for epidemiological study. But if you just focus on the major criteria, the top left, uh, adult patients and adult onset AD, 100% of them should have pruritus. That's a major uh, mandatory criteria for, for making the diagnosis. That typical morphology and distribution, patients don't only ha always have that flexural lichenification uh, uh, with adult onset disease, and often they just have facial, uh, facial eczema with a smattering of eczema on the trunk, for example. So the, the typical morphology and distribution is not always clear uh, in your adult patients or your adult onset patients. The disease should be chronic and relapsing, uh, of course, and often uh, a personal history of atopic disease can help you make that diagnosis. But there are other adult eczemas that you need to consider. So these are uh, conditions uh, that have been labeled as dermatitis not otherwise specified or chronic eczematous eruption of the elderly or urticarial dermatitis, for example. These are terms in the literature. And I often wonder, are these really cases of undiagnosed uh, atopic dermatitis? And I think we still need to uh, get better biomarkers for, for defining atopic dermatitis and then apply them to these other uh, um, more atypical and non, uh, nondescript uh, eczemas in your older uh, patients. Other more defined dermatitides or eczematous uh, conditions in the adult are things like this. So this is an eczematous, very round plaque. This is what the patient looked like from afar. And you can see that these are very coin-shaped or, or uh, numular uh, uh, eczema uh, in this adult patient, very itchy, also called numular dermatitis. Other things to consider in the differential for atopic dermatitis in the adult is allergic contact dermatitis. This is exe typical eczematous lesions in an atypical location for AD. 
uh, and this patient was allergic to their Tom's main deodorant uh, and, and specifically to lichen acid, uh, in, in, and this is four patients that we had uh, described. This is a patient with an eczematous eruption that's not, not typical, uh, and if you look closely uh, at, these, at these lesions, you can see this uh, kind of scalloped scale that's typical for xerotic dermatitis, and this patient was uh, in and out of a hot tub about 14 times a day, uh, he said. And so had, um, and so this improved with just moisturization. Now, patients with dermatitis uh, in the elderly is specific is, is particularly difficult, um, and they may be particularly predisposed to getting atopic or dermatitis type of lesions uh, because aging itself. This is from a recent review of all the various um, uh, all, all all the various uh, impacts and abnormalities that can occur with just aging alone, uh, which is uh, basically a barrier, skin barrier disruption happens over time. Uh, there's a reduction of lipids in the skin. Uh, there's a, re a reduction in the uh, biophysical uh, skin barrier for multiple reasons. There are changes in your both innate immunity and adaptive immunity with age that can lead someone to become more predisposed to atopic dermatitis uh, when you're over 65. But it's just challenging because we often don't think of this diagnosis. There's a lack of AD criteria for it, for the elderly. There's a lack of natural course information. Is this gonna is this transient uh, or is this gonna continue on throughout the patient's life? We don't know this information yet. Patients often have multiple comorbidities and medications, which makes treatment difficult and more dangerous, uh, and because you need to worry about drug interactions and effects on kidney uh, and liver function. Moving on to AD pathogenesis, I'm not a basic scientist. I'm going to give you my kind of clinical perspective, and it gives you a framework of how to discuss this with your patients. I often think of atopic dermatitis as having both immune dysfunction and epidermal barrier dysfunction, and these actually interplay with each other with the, with the inflammation worsening skin barrier dysfunction, and, and genetic skin barrier dysfunction can initiate uh, inflammation and immune responses that, uh, that are dysregulated. I tell my patients that there's a genetic influence of the disease, and actually 70% of atopic dermatitis risk is likely genetic when you look at twin studies. And so I often tell patients, you know, you were probably programmed from birth to develop this condition, uh, and, and it, this gives them an idea that this is not probably a curable condition and puts patients into the mindset that we're going to be in this for the long haul and we need to find a safe management therapy um, just like we would manage other long-term diseases like hypertension or diabetes. And then, of course, not everyone with the genetics for atopic dermatitis gets atopic dermatitis. So, for example, filaggrin is the strongest gene ever uh, found to predict atopic dermatitis, and it's a functional uh, gene mutation where you lose um, uh, an important protein that maintains your skin barrier. Not everyone with a filaggrin gene mutation gets atopic dermatitis, and so there are environmental factors and other genes involved in the immune system that can influence whether you're going to get this disease or not. But, it, but the bottom line is that when, once you have atopic dermatitis, there's a cycle of skin barrier dysfunction that leads to uh, inflammation that then feeds back onto skin barrier dysfunction. And as shown here, Type 2 cytokines such as IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, IL-31, that is what seems to be one of the most important um, uh, uh, immune biases in the inflammation in the skin as well as the blood. And you can actually see this inflammation pattern also, not just in skin, but in blood. And these are, you can see type 2 uh, cytokines and chemokines, but you also see a smattering of other, uh, of other uh, TH uh, one, Th22 cytokines, uh, both in skin inf infiltrates and in the blood. So we often think, especially in patients with a more moderate severe uh, disease, that this is a systemic disease uh, that can affect multiple organs, such as the heart, the brain, potentially, the skin, of course, uh, the mucosal surfaces that cause allergic rhinitis, uh, as well as lung that, that causes asthma. And, and it's not just type 2, although that's probably the most important, uh, but there's other defects and other cytokines involved um, from the Th1, Th17, Th22 pathway. Okay, so that's uh, the pathophysiology. 
Uh, let's move on to the patient and how this disease can impact your adult patient with more moderate to severe disease. So atopic dermatitis is often minimized. Uh, that is, quote, just eczema, end quote. But I think studies such as this that show the utility scores, meaning how healthy you are uh, in general, uh, uh, using the SF6D kind of generic uh, quality of life instrument. A healthy person, the most healthy you could be would be one. You could see on average in this population, a healthy person was about 0.79. You can see that atopic dermatitis in the mild to severe uh, patients are on average show less general health than a healthy person at 0.69. But you can see that the moderate to severe atopics uh, uh, report uh, health levels, health utility scores that are actually comparable to other important, uh, equally important uh, chronic, chronic diseases such as high blood pressure and heart disease even. So this, is, this disease has a significant burden on patients that are uh, medically quite relevant and we need to spread the word about how important and how uh, impactful this disease can be to our patients. Now, typical symptoms, of course, are itch. 86% uh, reporting itch occurring uh, every day. 42% of patients reported itch lasting greater than 18 hours a day, with 61% reporting that this, the itch is severe or unbearable. We often don't think about pain, but actually quite a few patients report, uh, especially if you have moderate to severe disease, moderate or ex extreme pain in the skin lesions, and they can differentiate between itch and pain. So an under-recognized symptom uh, that uh, helps us understand the burden on patients. And you can imagine if you have significant itch and pain that your sleep's disturbed. And once you have sleep disturbance, that then has so many downstream effects uh, on a patient's quality of life, on an adult patient's quality of life. So symptoms can then lead to poor sleep, which actually can then lead to mental health uh, abnormalities. Uh, it's uh, a very unpredictable uh, disease, and, and patients always are concerned about when the next flare is coming. Uh, there's a high proportion of patients with anxiety and depression that we'll talk about next. Comorbidities add to the burden. Patients have asthma, allergic rhinitis, uh, as well as non-atopic uh, comorbidities. This can affect their work, uh, either at work presenteeism or absenteeism, missing work because of severe skin flares and infection, and that can affect some, a patient, an adult's self-esteem. When you look at your adult patients with moderate to severe disease, if you look at the left, 50% uh, of patients have anxiety and depression scales on the, on the HAD scale of greater than eight. So that means 50% of patients with moderate to severe disease uh, have clinically relevant anxiety and depression symptoms. So I think this is important as a clinician to know that these are confounding factors that are adding to the burden of your patient, and that should prompt you to be more aggressive in treatment of these of patients with moderate to severe disease, because we know with good adequate with adequate treatment, these scores actually improve uh, over time. You can make a big difference not just in the symptoms as a clinician in the symptoms, but you can make a di big difference in their quality of life as well as even their mental health uh, uh, status. Other aspects of this disease in, in this more severe patient populations are skin infections uh, are quite common. So you see a staph infection uh, or step strep on the left with pustules, uh, sometimes erosion, erosions and pain. And I hope that all of you can recognize the condition on the right uh, if you look at the lip, that'll give you a clue. But these punched out erosions and scalloped borders of some of the coalescing erosions give you, uh, should give you uh, a hint that this is uh, eczema herpeticum and can be painful, can be misdiagnosed, and can become uh, quite severe, uh, and including even life-threatening. So this patient should be placed on appropriate antiviral therapy as soon as possible. And then don't forget that our treatments uh, also add to burden, especially in our adult patients. All the appointments, the if phototherapy is used, applying the medications, they can be greasy, they can be embarrassing, they can uh, get in the way of, of clo work clothing. Um, sometimes they're overly complicated. We do three different topical steroid. Um, uh, uh, um, we use a PD-4 inhibitor and a TCI, all in the same patient. 
um, it can be quite confusing. So try to, to keep things simple, which we'll, we'll talk about um, therapy. Uh, and, then, and then they can also be costly, so always keep cost in mind. Okay, so let's start moving towards therapy, how you're gonna help your patients. And the first step in uh, helping patients and discussing therapy and, and coming up with a regimen is assessing the severity. So, of course, you want to um, uh, evaluate the patient. What have they used in the past? How is this affecting their life? Um, what have they had adverse events to any, uh, adverse effects to any therapies? How, how are they using their therapies specifically? So that helps you move, uh, move into a treatment uh, program that's uh, gonna be individualized for that patient. One more thing you can use when you're assessing your patient uh, is using a patient reported outcome. Patients really like the idea that you're trying to understand more about them from their perspective. Even just using a patient global assessment, having a patient state whether they're mild, moderate, or severe. Another easy one to use is an NRS itch numerical rating scale, zero to 10. Tell me what your itch has been over the last 24 hours, either peak itch or average itch. These are both valid measures. Gives you some insight into their symptomatology and the degree and the severity of their symptoms. The atopic dermatitis control tool or ADCT and recap tools, these were, um, these are seven question multi-domain um, uh, instruments that measure the domain of control. And you can find these for free on the homeforeczema.org website. And then more quality of life measures like the Dermatology Life Quality Index or POEM, a, a symptom scale can be used. Uh, and these are more like 10, seven to 10 questions long. They give you more information about the patients. The patients appreciate it. And here's just some more examples. This is a poem on your left. A PO, PO score ad is an app that patients can do at home. And here's an example of the itch numeric scale. Okay, so let's move on to therapy of your patient with moderate to severe disease. So the first question is, when do you use systemic treatment for this group? And this is an International Eczema uh, Council uh, consensus conference. And we decided that um, the, the time to use systemic therapy is basically when aggressive topical therapy has not achieved adequate control of the disease. If you've developed adequate education, you've addressed infection, the, the disease has a large impact on their quality of life, you've stopped and thought about other diagnoses, there may be some reason why the patient's not responding to normal topical therapy. Could this be cutaneous T-cell lymphoma? Could this be allergic contact dermatitis? Should you biopsy, should you patch test to rule this out before moving on to more aggressive therapy? You wanna consider phototherapy first. That's the safest uh, treatment available for patients failing topical. But if you've considered all of this and, you've, uh, and patients are truly failing topical therapy, you've addressed uh, uh, corticosteroid phobia, then that identifies a patient who uh, warrants a discussion of systemic treatments for moving on to the more aggressive type therapy. There is no one score, there is no one number that's gonna tell you when to use systemic therapy. I often find that educational messaging, uh, w when you're talking to the patient, can help them understand that we're in this for the long haul, that this is a chronic disease with no cure. Your immune system is overactive when you have moderate to severe eczema. Food allergy is not causing your eczema. Uh, and then understanding how it affects your life and the use of these uh, patient-reported outcomes is helpful to establish that burden. So let's look at our options for systemic treatment. Here are the options that are uh, presented in guidelines, and we'll talk about each one of these and how they fit in. Because you have all of these options, really the best approach is to use a shared decision-making approach. You just got, you work together you do the first step of team talk, what's the patient's goals, uh, let them know that, you're, that they're in charge of the decision. Step two is talking about all the different options and then empowering the patient to make that decision so they're on board, they, they know that you're doing this together. And this discussion is difficult. There's so many things to consider. So this is, just, this is a, a, a mind map of when you're talking about and thinking about a systemic intervention whole bunch of things to think about, the severity, the patient's quality of life, what their goals are, their preferences, et cetera. So this is what you do so well as a clinician, and, and this is what you work through with your patients to find
find uh, the right therapy. There are some st um, studies looking at uh, uh, different phenotypes of patients. So maybe there are some patients who uh, who who um, present to you that are uh, Asian or African American uh, or have a certain presentation, and maybe that should guide your treatment because we are finding slight different uh, inflammatory infiltrates in the skin and blood amongst these various populations. For example, uh, you can see in panel D. European populations don't have as much TH17, whereas Asian patients do. Although in both in both cases, they have TH2 and TH22 are very important. This the the science is not, and the studies have not borne this out uh, that there are clinically relevant differences uh, in ethnicities uh, or in presentations of a, of adult or pediatric, for example. And so I think this is still in the research phase. And I, don't, and I don't use phenotype or ethnicity or, or age, really, to, to um, change my uh, choice for systemic therapy. So let's first think, uh, talk about non-biological systemic treatment. So this is uh, before the advent of uh, dupilumab, which is the first biologic approved. Uh, the most commonly, this, is, this was my interpretation of the guidelines and uh, is used by many of the um, uh, by many dermatologists who see a lot of severe atopic dermatitis, cyclosporin uh, used at high doses anywhere between four and 12 months to try to achieve clearance of the disease, and then and then transitioning these patients to something safer long term, such as phototherapy or methotrexate. So why is cyclosporin used uh, as a, a first line? It's the most effective non-biological systemic therapy. I recommend using five milligrams per kilogram per day uh, and then adjust according to side effects and taper down as things are controlled. The, this therapy is the most well-studied um, prior to dupilumab uh, with 11 randomized controlled trials. I use it both in children and adults, and there's anywhere between 50 and up to 85% improvement uh, of, uh, in, skin, um, in skin outcomes. You need to watch out for for hypertension and renal insufficiency, however, this is almost a given at five mg per kg, and this is more important uh, in adults who may already have a baseline renal insufficiency. So you need to be very uh, careful, and I would avoid using this uh, this drug in patients who have hard to control hypertension uh, or have renal insufficiency or have a history of um, systemic infection or, or malignancy. So we try to use cyclosporin short term. Uh, achieve control and then move the patient to methotrexate, uh, which is a safer long-term option. It just does not work quite as well. And you can see here in two controlled studies, you improve atopic dermatitis by about 42 to, uh, to 49%. Uh, you can use this in children as well at the doses shown here. It is pregnancy, uh, it, it's contraindicated uh, in pregnancy. Um, and the way uh, we do it here at our university is we overlap the methotrexate with cyclosporin at about half doses, although you need to be very ca uh, cautious with this combination. There's one study comparing methotrexate versus cyclosporin, and you can see at eight weeks, even with the half dose of cyclosporin, that the proportion of achieving 50% improvement in the overall score ad, which is a holistic score that includes both the skin scores and sleep and itch, you can see cyclosporin was significantly better. But if you continue over time and you look at the 20-week data, a higher dose of methotrexate uh, starts catching up and, uh, to the uh, higher dose cyclosporin. Mycophenolate mofetil is another option as an oral immunosuppressant. Also is contraindicated in pregnancy. Uh, the effects uh, in one RCT showed comparability to cyclosporin, um, although uh, there were some problems with this study and I do not see this comparability. Uh, I, don't, I do not see it work as well as cyclosporin in practice. The nice thing is there's no renal toxicity or hepatotoxicity, and it's safe for use in children. Azathioprine is, um, it used to be a very commonly used um, therapy, although it has very modest improvement in the three randomized controlled trials. It's less expensive than other immunosuppressants, and you can use it in children, although I do get concern regarding a potential lymphoma risk uh, with long-term use, especially in children. I, I am uh, using this uh, less and less in my practice. 
There's other limitations to traditional uh, systemic treatments. So we talked about the hypertension and kidney toxicity, and so cyclosporin should be limited to one to two years of use only. Methotrexate has potential hepatotoxicity. Other options are just less effective, so the mycophenolate mofetil, nasocyprin, and drug survival is short for, for this chronic disease. If you look at studies, all the drug survival, uh, they're all less than 50% at one year for all of these traditional immunosuppressants because of lack of effect and because of adverse events. Well, what about systemic steroid? It's probably one of the most commonly used uh, therapies. The literature does support short-term use. So you can definitely decrease the severity of atopic dermatitis uh, that can interrupt a flare. The problem is the doses is not, we don't really understand dosing, what's the most ap appropriate dose. And we also know that upon stopping oral steroids, the disease returns immediately and oftentimes worse than when you started. So we really try to limit our short-term uh, uh, oral or systemic steroid use in our patients with atopic dermatitis uh, because of the rebound effect and because it does not represent a safe long-term option. The next uh, drug to discuss and the most recently approved uh, and is really the first systemic drug in the U.S. that's approved for uh, atopic dermatitis is dupilumab. Dupilumab is a biologic or a monoclonal antibody therapy that blocks the IL-4 receptor alpha. And by blocking this uh, receptor subunit, you can actually block the signaling of both IL-4 and IL-13. Those are those type 2 cytokines that are so important to this disease. So the FDA approved this drug in March of 2017 for adults and uh, with atopic dermatitis and approved in uh, March 2019 <clears throat> for adolescents 12 years and older. There are trials uh, that are currently ongoing down to six months of age. They're also, uh, the drug is also approved for, uh, uh, for asthma in adolescents, and there are trials for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, esophageal, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, as well as peanut allergy. So if you just look at the key uh, reduction in atopic dermatitis, this is a, a study called Kronos where they included topical steroids. And this is a 52-week study, and you can see there's about a 78 to 80% reduction in the overall severity, it's called the easy score in the skin signs, uh, compared to placebo, which is 46% reduction. This is highly statistically significant. There are no, no real differences between the weekly and the two-week dosing, so the FDA-approved dosing is every other week. Now, because dupilumab blocks TH2 cytokines, it affects not only and improves not only the uh, patient's um, uh, skin, it also reduces uh, the patient's itch, uh, itch reduction of about 55%, and quality of life measures significantly improved, as well as even that HAD scale, the anxiety and depression symptoms, had significant reduction. So you can improve patient's skin as well as their quality of life, as well as their mental health, and even uh, asthma. So further studies are ongoing now to determine uh, different subpopulations of eczema and atopic dermatitis. Uh, for example, this is a patient of mine who had atopic dermatitis on the body, but the question remains, does it work for hand eczema? Um, and you can see here this patient has uh, significant lichenification and excoriation on the wrists and palms and fingers. And you can see after uh, a few months of dupilumab treatment, his hands are now clear. And every patient has a story. This patient, uh, every patient has a story of how this disease can affect them. And this patient was so surprised that he, and, and the, thing, the, small, the small things uh, meant so much, uh, such as commenting, he was commenting on now he can actually touch his wife's hair, he can actually finally play tennis. And so it's the, the, the little things that's different for each patient uh, that can make a really big difference uh, in their overall uh, life. Safety of the biologic, we often get concerned with uh, infection, for example, uh, with biological use in psoriasis. But you can see here, this is the, the pooled 16-week uh, trials, phase three trials, uh, with, um, um, and, and basically the story from here is that there's no real increase in any AE, and the only AEs that are increased uh, are injection site reactions, so some slight burning uh, when, they, when you inject, uh, as well as conjunctivitis. 
The conjunctivitis is unknown. It only happens in patients with atopic dermatitis. It's usually mild to moderate in severity, however, so we don't usually uh, discontinue treatment. We send patients to ophthalmologists where they receive topical steroid drops or even uh, non-steroidal eye drops uh, to improve the inflammation, and often seems to resolve on its own. It's a, there's still ongoing studies to kind of further characterize uh, why these patients get uh, conjunctivitis uh, so frequently. It's usually about 20% uh, of patients. So the safety summary for dupilumab, there's no increase in adverse events compared to placebo, and there's actually reduced serious adverse events uh, in the treatment groups compared to placebo. And part of that is because it, dupilumab appears to reduce skin infections. So it's not immunosuppressive, it, uh, it actually uh, supports the immunity to better fight off um, staph infections and staph colonization. There are no significant lab changes. There's no lab monitoring required for this drug. And injection site reactions and conjunctivitis are the most common things that you should know about. So in summary, dupilumab is safe and effective for AD that f for patients failing adequate topical therapy. It blocks IL-4 and 13 signaling, controls itch itching, redness, and quality of life, as well as mental health. The conjunctivitis injection site reactions um, should be um, understood and monitored. You do not need a lot of monitored labs. Uh, you can find reduced skin infections and EH risk, uh, and it does not appear to be an immunosuppressive, uh, and vaccine responses are normal even on drug. So I think this leads to you as a clinician to have this shared decision making. This is just one example to discuss the pros and cons of cyclosporine, methotrexate, dupilumab and inform your patient and let them make the choice of what sounds best for them. You help arm them uh, to make this decision. And of course, other factors are involved, comorbidities, other medications, and of course, insurance coverage. Uh, and sometimes that is the most, uh, the, the most important thing to help guide the decision. There's, uh, Dupilumab's led the way for innovation. There's a whole bunch of horses in the race now. If you look on the left, Nemalizumab blocking IL-31, the itch cytokine. There's two IL-13 alone blockade, uh, tralokinumab and lebrikizumab, uh, as well as some uh, um, co-stimulatory mo molecule OX-40 blockade and uh, IL-17C that have some uh, very nice uh, new data that appear, uh, that appear positive, uh, especially in the IL-31 and 13 realm. We're still looking for uh, control data for other targets that you can see here in the yellow box uh, that are all present in atopic dermatitis. Uh, and then there's been some uh, recent failures, and you can see this targets on the right uh, where control data has have been negative. So there's a lot of exciting development in this field. Uh, and it's not just the biologics, it's also the, uh, the oral therapies. And the most exciting oral therapies are JAK inhibitors. And there's three new JAK inhibitors entering phase three data, or are getting phase three data, baricitinib, abrocitinib, and upadacitinib. And these are specific JAK inhibitors that block cytokine signaling. And so they can reduce inflammation using an oral pill and that are, that are more um, uh, targeted than uh, systemic steroid, more targeted than um, cyclosporin or the other traditional immunosuppressive therapies, uh, and they're actually uh, having results for some of these molecules uh, that are equal to the biologics. So we really uh, we're anticipating approval of these drugs from the FDA uh, over the next year, one to two years, and we'll give our patients an oral option for treatment. There's other study, uh, other targets under study, and other molecules. Uh, such as anti-itch uh, therapies, a, a kappa opioid receptor agonist, as well as a, a neurokinin-1 receptor uh, uh, antagonist, and some other uh, interesting proprietary lipids. There are some remaining questions. Are there really meaningful clinical subtypes of atopic dermatitis that we should be identifying? How do we define them? Are there biomarkers that can predict which uh, treatment would be best for that patient, so-called personalized medicine? Is elderly dermatitis really atopic dermatitis? Uh, what, what role do medications play in initiating atopic dermatitis in the elderly? Can we improve upon dupilumab efficacy? Can we find a way to prevent the conjunctivitis? And can, is targeting IL-13 alone sufficient, or do we need to block both IL-4 and 13? 
And then our JAK inhibitors, the, or, the new exciting oral pills, are these going to be safe enough for long-term use like the biologics? So in summary, there are numerous targeted therapies being, being developed for atopic dermatitis. It's really, we're really entering uh, an era of innovation and excitement and hope for our patients. The blockade of IL-4 and 13 is very effective and safe strategy. And other, these other oral um, agents target these extracellular uh, targets and have uh, activity. The JAK inhibitors are promising, but the efficacy will need to be carefully balanced with the side effect profile. It's really an exciting time for patients suffering from AD and for dermatologists to be uh, uh, providing uh, new, novel, and safe therapies uh, for your patients. Thank you.